go over number five on the physics homework. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, give me a moment, Blaine, and I will go ahead and pull up that document. Okay. This guy right here, what's the force required for a deltoid that inserts 10 centimeters down a one meter arm that weighs 10 kilograms in the moment of inertia is located at 60% of its length from the shoulder joint and the arm is being held at a 15 degree angle to the floor. Okay, deltoid attaches at a 20 degree angle. So, a lot of weird stuff you guys gotta, you gotta do on the setup here. First and foremost, we need to figure out, okay, how far is the center of mass for our resistance? So it's 60, the center of mass is at 60% of the length. But since it's only at a 15 degree angle, now we've got to go ahead and do our trig. So that 15 degree angle is obviously facing on the downward side. So what that means is effectively, we need to take the sine of 15 degrees, and then multiply that by what'll be 0.6 meters, because it's gonna be 60%, sorry, times what is going to be 10 kilograms, that's a, that's a heavy dang arm, which is going to equal the sine of 15 degrees times 10, ten centimeters, which means 0 0.1 meters. And then that is going to be equal to our force. And then remember, once we do get to the force, the deltoid is attaching at a 20 degree angle. So since we're only having a 20 degree angle going through, we're once again going to be effectively, yeah, we're going to have to use our trig and eventually factor in the sine of 20 degrees equals our, it's gonna be our force that we've pulled out earlier divided by the hypotenuse, which is the actual force. Good blink. Cool. All right. So we left off talking about how whenever you don't have force that your bone has to deal with, it's going to lose bone mineral density. Now, this can be from a myriad of things. I gave the example of the uh, astronauts. It's just to be keeping in mind when we wanna have better bone mineral density with individuals, we have to pick exercises that require weight bearing and then move our way up into intensity in that it's not just weight bearing, but it's also impact based. Now, right here, we just have that structure of the long bone. So you can see the difference between our cortical bone on the outside We've got our trabecular bone that's spongy on the, in, on the inner layer and then more at each of the ends so that we, we can effectively build up the strength of the area where we happen to receive the greatest amount of force. And then remember when we're talking about the femur, we've got the neck and then the head, which does have cartilage that is going to obviously help with allowing for easier interfacing with our joint. But remember also it gives us a weak point. Now, overall, how do our bones respond to training? Well, it turns out they're going to get bigger, but not necessarily bigger in that all of a sudden your bones are gonna get longer. 
they're going to get bigger in the fact that they're going to become denser, they're going to become heavier. So this is all coming down to an aspect of what's known as Wolf's Law, which is where the size, shape, and every and the other effect of, effects of bones are going to be related to the magnitude and direction of force that acts upon them. So most of our bones have pretty good, essentially, density that specifically is oriented in a way to deal with compression and or tension. Now, if you happen to be exposing yourself to a lot of shear, we're going to start to see increase in bone mineral density. Not just specifically denser bone, but denser in the way to deal with that shearing stress. So I'm quite sure if you looked at like a pitcher's humerus, you'd see a greater amount of effectively more spiral shaped uh, cord or sorry, trabecular bone to help reinforce the humerus from all of the high speed internal rotation that's going on. And same thing with someone that's probably a professional arm wrestler, where it's going to literally be hypertrophied to deal with a greater amount of that. So what's gonna promote this bone mineral density? Well, it turns out to be anything where we have to bear weight and the greater the force that we have to deal with, the greater the activation of those osteoblasts that in turn are going to increase our bone mineral density. So go ahead in the chat or you guys can go ahead and unmute yourself. When we talk about obviously weight bearing exercises, you can think of anything from walking to sprinting, et cetera. But what would you say is something you can do in the gym or do something at home that's actually gonna give you the greatest forces that your body is going to have to deal with to increase bone mineral density? What about weighted walking lunges? Yeah, not a bad idea. Now, if you're doing walking lunges, you're definitely gonna have a greater amount of weight in the body. And the same thing if you do squatting, obviously it's a greater amount of weight going through your skeleton. But think back, think back to the good days, folks, when we were still on campus. What lab did we have you guys do where you had probably the greatest amount of force going through your lower body? Actually, you guys didn't get to do that because things broke down before that. If you're looking at probably the greatest forces you have to encounter, it probably involves plyometrics where you're gonna be obviously, you know, jumping off the ground and landing. And then on top of that, you know, jumping and landing, then you can be literally doing things like playing combat contact sports where you're encountering another person where it's not just the force that you produce, but the force they're producing back into you. That's gonna have pretty great amount of force you have to deal with, which is gonna increase bone mineral density. Now that doesn't mean that grandma should go out there and try to do blocking drills as a lineman, but, like anything else, building up the exercise intensity to where, yeah, effectively all we're doing is just trying to walk. And then maybe we're trying to go kind of a mall walk and then eventually maybe doing a very, very low level plyometric, but it's still gonna help with bone mineral density, like jumping rope. Because one of the things that oh, it surprised me whenever I was doing my master's reading some information on bone mineral density, your average long distance runner actually has denser vertebrae in their neck than your average weightlifter. Why do you guys think that would be? All right, Celia, why do you think that would be? Um, because like every time they hit the ground, it the force goes through their vertebrae, unlike weightlifters. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That natural jostling that they get while they're running, even if they're pretty smooth long distance, still their skull bouncing through their cervical column, which is turning out to activate those osteoblasts a little bit to increase that bone mineral density. If you're a weightlifter, unless you're actively doing resistance training with your neck, you're in theory should never really have to deal with greater amount of force through your neck. And so because of that, it doesn't really have to hypertrophy. So let's talk about osteoporosis. There's both type one and type two. Type one is the type that typically affects women after they go through menopause. Estrogen has a lot of positive effects on the human body. It helps with insulin sensitivity and it also helps with bone mineral density and it also helps a little bit with cardiac function and health. And that's why like heart attack risks between men and women uh, for women, it's much, much lower until menopause. And then after menopause, it's about the same risk for both genders. Now, the second is going to be that age associated. And when we're talking about being over the age of 70, where it's going to come down to, once again, what is the typical amount of impacts and otherwise you're dealing with? And all of your physiological systems are constantly adapting to the man's. And most people, when they get older, they tend to be more sedentary. In fact, hitting the ground constantly. Yeah, yeah, Blaine. Anytime that you're hitting the ground, that force has to be absorbed through not just your joints, but your bone structure. So, and your muscles. Like anything else, if we're no longer having to deal with that impact on the ground, we're not going to have that remodeling that's going to occur or just a general upkeep. Because your body's in a constant state of both trying to build things up and tear things down at the same time. Because turns out building more bone costs energy and costs nutrients. Building more muscle costs energy, costs nutrients. Getting rid of bone and muscle frees up energy and nutrients. So if the body can get rid of tissue, specifically tissue that's not just expensive to build, but then expensive for upkeep, it's going to go ahead and do so. And because of that, you know, trying to stay physically active, especially if you're naturally a smaller person, so that way you're going to maintain your bone mineral density. So the real key is just to make sure that you are staying physically active. Now, for women post-menopause, looking at hormone replacement therapy can be a decent use. There is some research out there showing the dangers of hormone replacement therapy, but like anything else, whenever you're using hormones to replace what you previously had, you have to make sure that you're doing it appropriately. And you've got a number of people that are pretty unhealthy and then you give them hormones. So all of a sudden they feel very uh, energetic and better. Well, for lack of a better term, um, I got to, I went up to the Arnold back in March and got to see the presentation by Jose Antonio, um, and uh, sorry, not Jose Antonio, it was um, um, Eric Serrano and um, Rick Collins and uh, George uh, Tostolis, which they talked about hormone replacement therapy, the legal natures of using different uh, testosterone, CBD, SARMs, a couple other things for performance enhancement or just recovery. And what was really fascinating, um, Eric Serrano was talking about the dangers of using testosterone as hormone replacement therapy and the issue with the research where it does show in a number of populations that it increases all cause mortality. And he goes, well, if you actually read the literature, the guys they're giving this to are dudes that started off over 60, morbidly obese by BMI. And now they give them testosterone. So now they've got all this energy and how to say they've got, yeah, they've, they've reawoken their sex drive and everything else. And now they feel good. They try to go from zero to a hundred out there trying to work out, play sports and do other adult activities. And it turns out their heart is pretty damn sedentary, pretty damn untrained. And then they have a heart attack and die. So I'm just keeping that in mind. Now, when it comes to dietary intake, I'm quite sure all of you guys have heard about the importance of calcium and vitamin D for bone mineralization, which is absolutely true. 
But the other mineral and vitamin to keep in mind that's very important for bone mineral density is actually going to be magnesium because it is going to be calcium sparing and is used in a lot of metabolic processes in the body. But additionally, vitamin K. Vitamin K is not just going to help with mineralization of your bones when taken in a high enough level, especially after the initial effects of that's going to be blood clotting, but it also is going to help with decalcifying your arteries, which literally makes them function better and decreases your risk of heart attacks and strokes. Now, the last thing to keep in mind is just avoiding excess consumption of drugs. Now, notice because of our societal uh, constructs that are rather arbitrary, caffeine is a drug, alcohol is a drug, nicotine is a drug, marijuana is a drug, cocaine is a drug. Now, obviously, they're all drugs. Some are more potent than others, and they obviously affect the body in different physi physiological ways. But your issue is specifically more with alcohol than anything else is people are going to replace their useful calories with, you know, food that would have some nutrients and not just, you know, your protein, carbs, and fats with booze. And it turns out there's no very limited vitamins and minerals in just about anything you drink. And because of that, you're not going to get as much. Now, as far as younger individuals, this can happen. But typically, it's going to occur in uh, females, specifically as a component of the female athlete triad, which is a horrible thing to try to avoid with athletes. And then also to make sure that if you're working with an athlete, if there's a coaching culture that's trying to really limit body size or really trying to lord over the athlete's diets to be aware of it, because like anything else, disordered eating which can show itself as things like bulimia, things like anorexia nervosa, or just some other modifications to the diet, which can be very easy to overlook and instead think that people are doing things that are positive for their health, when in reality it's detrimental. Now, are you guys aware of what amenorrhea is? Okay. Amenorrhea is the loss of the normal menstrual cycle. The nice thing about female or about being female is your cycle is a pretty good indicator of overall energy availability in the body and like overall just a slight indicator of reproductive health. As a male, you don't have that, but it also means having a period, which from everything I've heard from most of the women that I've met in my life, isn't that great of a thing. Now, amenorrhea means it stops. Now, oligorrhea is when it starts to get weird. Now, every woman has their own cycle. Some women, it's literally, I've heard of nightmare ones where it's literally only two weeks long. I've heard of others where women naturally have a two to three month cycle. And it's not like one's wrong or one's right. It's their own physiology and their own baseline. But as soon as that cycle is being disrupted, the first thing the body does whenever you have a lack of caloric intake, like you're legitimately starving or you're lacking the vitamins and minerals, is it effectively really starts pulling back of putting resources into reproduction. So obviously for females, that's not just ovulation, but that's repairing, you know, rebuilding the uterine lining and everything else for the possibility of becoming pregnant. For males, it's going to be your sperm production and otherwise. And then to a lesser extent, the hormones related to giving you the desire to have sex that would you know, create a child. Now, the problem is as soon as you've eaten away at that first system of you're no longer ovulating like you normally would as a female, which then lends itself into the menstruating on the other side of it, the next system that the body is going to start under fueling is going to be your immune system, your muscular skeletal system, your digestive system, and it's going to keep resources for your nervous system and your cardiovascular system because those are the two most important to keep you alive. So because of that, when we're working with athletes, if they're already going amenorrheic, well, now they're probably cutting away from, once again, that muscular skeletal system. So that's when they can start to show up with osteopenia and osteoporosis. So when you do work with athletes, it's really important to look for certain signs. Now, it can be really, really hard. People think of the cliche things of like, oh, 
if somebody eats a big meal but then always goes to the bathroom at the end of the meal, or someone keeps wearing very baggy clothing so you can't really see, it's, it's very difficult. And st statistically speaking, the most lethal mental disorder is actually anorexia nervosa, which is terrifying, but is something to be aware of. And most importantly, I'd say up here, is don't overemphasize weight. And that can be very, very difficult because some sports have a major incentive on body size. But making sure that you're approaching that appropriately with athletes so that we're not putting themselves into these situations of making sure that they have a good relationship with food, meaning, you know, they're eating when they're hungry, they feel that they can eat just about anything that they like. It's can be very dangerous to get into the style of thinking if I can only eat this type of food, but not that type of food, this is a safe food, this is an unsafe food, and then making sure that everyone in uh, essentially that person's social circle understands, you know, how this needs to be approached. Because you know, it turns out I've been around collegiate cheerleading for a long time. And, you know, I've seen a number of people with eating disorders go through it. And like anything else, now that I have the chance to coach a little bit, I'm very mindful of trying to make sure that this doesn't happen. But at the same time, it's, it's very important because it's not always the coaches. Sometimes it's just the social pressure. Like it turns out I, um, I swam a lot growing up and played a sport called water polo. It's really hard on the horses. Um, and, you know, I was pretty used to standing around in, um, you know, effectively a speedo. So that's more or less kind of me just not caring. Now, a lot of folks play sports where the aesthetic doesn't matter. You know, if you're playing softball, you're out there in a softball uniform, you're not out there in a swimsuit. But as soon as you make it so that there's the aesthetic side that's obviously apparent, you know, you can have people that, you know, pull out of sports like swimming, um, obviously cheerleading and so on, where because they have to wear arguably a much tighter uniform that can be really uncomfortable if you are uncomfortable with your body size and shape and that you know, it can happen to anybody at any body size. So it's just something to be mindful of. And then we have our happy picture over in the bottom right of the different ways that you can fracture bones. So it turns out none of which are a great time, but like anything, it's going to depend on the severity of where the injury came from, uh, the amount of force, obviously, that was provided along with the surface area of the implement. And then like anything else, the bones are going to remodel as long as they're set appropriately. And hopefully that individual is going to be able to go back to enjoying whatever sport they were breaking their tibia doing after a long enough period of time. But hopefully, like anything else, the hairline, that's something that you can recover from relatively quickly. It's going to be individuals that have these effectual, how was it? Yeah, a common fracture where you've not just broke the bone, but then you have literally fragments. And this is usually where you have to talk about screws and wires to reset the bone and keep it in place. Now, any questions about bone physiology? Anything that we've covered today? You guys would like me to talk about more? Well, seeing as now there's a solid amount of silence, let's go ahead and talk away about joints. So we've got effectively two major buckets. Well, actually, it's going to be more than that. Sorry. It's going to be three major buckets that in turn, we have sub buckets. So first one's going to be the synethroses, and these are effectively our immovable joints. So examples of this are gonna be like the sutures of our skull, and then things like the cinemoses of where our tibia and fibular joints come together. Now, these can move a little bit, but it's very, very small amounts. Now, what's even more interesting is it's when you're very young, specifically when you're working with like 
toddlers, children, the skull, the synethroses, the bones of the skull can still move to a relatively high degree. Now, the amphithroses are going to go ahead and be joints that are slightly movable. So this can be those epiphyseal plates at the end of our joints, hence why it's really not a good choice to max out young kids because it turns out they still have that movement. And then we're going to have other moments like our symphyses where we're going to have a little bit of movement like a vertebral joint. And the other one that I think is important to bring up is going to be things like our SI joint. So where our sacrum and our ileus and iliac come together. Now we then have what we typically think of as our joints is the diarthroidal joints, the synovia. Okay. These are going to have cartilage on either sides of the bones where they're coming together. And then it's going to have a capsule that keeps everything in that position. Inside of that capsule, we're going to have what's known as synovial fluid. And that's going to be that liquid that's going to naturally lubricate that joint when it's moving. And we're going to have some forms of bursa. And these are going to be those capsules filled also with synovial fluid that's going to cushion the structures that happen to be coming together there. Okay. Now, inside of those synovial joints, we have a number of different variations. We have our gliding, so that's going to be like the facets of our side, of our, sorry, facet joints of our vertebrae. We have our hinge, which is going to be just like our elbow. We're going to have our pivot, and that's going to be our radial ulnar, where we can turn our wrist, and that's literally just the twisting of a radius in our ulnar. We're going to have condyloids, so that's going to be effectively our wrist, where we've got our radius and then all of the different bones of our wrist. We have our saddle, which is a good example of that as the thumb. And then we have our ball and socket, and turns out both the shoulder and the hip are going to be great examples of it. Now, when it comes to that cartilage, the real use of it is it's going to allow for that load to be spread over a wider area. And if we think back to the basic physics we learned at the beginning of the class, what are we effectively doing by increasing the surface area? Taking away pressure. Bingo, bingo. Because remember, pressure equals force divided by the area. So if we can increase the amount of area and it's the same amount of force, we've gone and created a lower amount of pressure, which also, since we've got a greater amount of surface area, this allows for that lubrication. So we're gonna have less friction also at that joint because we've got more points of contact. Now, when we also, or we other, ugh, what we also have is what's known as fibrocartilage. And now this is going to be those soft tissue discs that make up the meniscus of our knee, which also increase the surface area of the knee, along with looking into things like our intervertebral discs that are not just cartilage, but thick bands of it that are going to allow for the distribution of this load over a larger surface. This also is going to improve the fit between the two sides and allow or to try to minimize the amount of slipping that might occur. Any questions about the difference between articular cartilage and then fibrocartilage? So I like how the last thing that Imani put up in chat was no. So every time I see that, I say that, I'm like, well, I guess we're good. And then I realized that was from quite a while ago. All right, so we then have our connective tissues. Now there's really just two major classes. It turns out we're going to have tendons and ligaments. Tendons connect bones to what? Thank you, Kylie. And whereas our ligaments are just connecting tendons to tendons. Now, tendons, just like muscles and just like bones, can adapt to the stressors placed upon them. So they can actually hypertrophy and increase in size and strength. So they're going to be able to deal with a greater amount of force production. 
And the other thing to keep in mind is tendons, just like ligaments, have a certain amount of stretch and elasticity to them. So one of the adaptations you're gonna have from training is literally your tendon is going to stretch under the load and then snap you back faster. And this is what allows for certain advantages from doing things like plyometric training, where you're learning not just to activate the muscle mass quickly, but that muscle mass literally pulls on the tendon and then the tendon essentially is gonna snap itself shorter together. And that's what's giving us a certain amount of the elastic force that's helping us jump higher into the air. Because literally, they are dynamic structures that change with time. Now, obviously, you can tear your ligaments, you can tear your tendons, and they are going to rebuild themselves to a certain extent. But depending on how complete the tear is, obviously, if it's complete tear and it's not reattached, it's gone forever. And if it's a pretty thorough partial tear, you can reattach it. However, the tendons might never function the same way that they did previously because they only have a finite ability to repair themselves. And just like bones, tendons and ligaments have very, very poor vasculature. And since they've got poor vasculature, they get very bad nutrient flow, which means in order to get them to remodel and become better, you have to get them to move but you have to get them to move in such a way that isn't causing greater harm or issue that you already had damaging the joint more than you're allowing it to recover. Does that make sense to you guys? So, when we're talking about the articular connective tissue, guys, we have got from our meniscus, that's gonna be that fibrocartilage, but then if we're going for connective, we've got what are the two major ligaments that are inside of our knee? I'm sure somebody in the class has torn one of them at some point. All right, Colleen, you're next up. <laughs> Name me a little uh, side of the knee. ACL. Good. Anterior cruciate ligament, just like we've got our PCL. Thank you, Colleen. Now, so Jalen, go ahead and name me one of the ligaments that we have on the, not, in, not inside the knee, but on either side of the knee. Um, your meniscus? That's fibrocartilage, absolutely. But we're looking for ligament, not cartilage. Oh, your fibril collateral ligament? That's not a bad one. I like how we're reading the slide. What are we typically going to refer to that as instead? I don't know. That's okay. No, you guys are doing good. That's going to be when we're talking about things like our LCL and our MCL. So how many of you guys, and thank you, Jalen, know somebody that had like a not just an ACL tear but they also tore their meniscus and they tore their medial collateral ligament so their MCL sometimes refer to that as the athlete's triad when you're unfortunately blowing out your knee happens to football players but the problem is since the MCL actually touches the meniscus when you tear the MCL it tends to rip out the meniscus on the way too. Any of you guys ever had a friend that that happened to? Okay. So now joint stability obviously has a number of different 
definitions depending on who you're working with. All the word working from in this class is it's literally the ability of that joint to resist abnormal displacement of the articulating bones. Okay, so how much force does it really take in order to effectively not dislocate as far as, oh boy, you're having a bad day, but definitely putting the bone where it doesn't need to be. Now, most of our joints have a really closely reciprocating match between effectively both of the bone surfaces. So for example, when we're talking about the ball and socket for the hip, obviously it's much shallower. Whenever we're talking about the humerus and the glenoid process, we then have a number of ligaments and tendons that are gonna keep that joint into the socket. And another key component is a lack of fatigue. When our muscles become fatigued, we have more issues with literally keeping our joints in the socket. So when we talk about reciprocating shapes, literally just think about the ball and socket, think about the saddle joint like the thumb, and then think of the hinge when we're working with the elbow. And so you can already realize that the hinge joint for the knee compared to the hinge joint for the elbow have lesser amounts of essentially stability in the knee compared to the elbow joint. Now, then when we talk about those ligaments and tendons, the IT band is gonna be a good example of something that's contributing to stability at your knees by literally making sure that patella tracks appropriately. Now, do any of you guys have like hypermobility in your joints? I might pick on my wife and make her come in here and show off her shoulder mobility. Well, I'm seeing a lack of enthusiasm from the, these kids this morning. So my wife's luckily home today from the health department, so she doesn't have to go in. Okay. Huh? Hi. I'm is, not that mobile. You're not that mobile? So this is my wife, Lauren. Okay. So my wife's going to step into the frame a little bit more. Now, whenever you're ready, honey, let's go ahead and try to get our arm behind ourselves as far as we can. Turn. The fact that you can do that and just hang out and just like it's another day. So this is lending itself into joint flexibility. <laughs> she walks off. Do you still need me? No, perfect. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, honey. So which is the range of motion that we're going to get at that joint. Now, this is important because it's not just limited by our ligaments and tendinous, but muscular lengths. And obviously, depending on who we're working with and what we're doing, we're going to have a number of these factors influencing how far we can get someone to move through range of motion. So you just saw the example of my wife and I trying to get our arms behind our head. It turns out I'm a bit more of a tight tiger. Like I can barely get back there, whereas she, like anytime that we would swim together, it's pretty obvious that she's the one that shoulders move like they're supposed to. And Outside of the muscle and tendon, you have to keep in mind with muscular fatigue, you can actually sometimes stretch a little bit better when a muscle is fatigued, which it can be a bit of an issue. You can also have problems with previous injuries. So for how, when you guys are watching this, how big is the screen of effectively me? Like, can you see what I'm doing on the video pretty well? Okay, so it's relatively small. Okay, so thanks to a, literally doing a basket and cheerleading, you can see how I cannot open my left thumb as far as I can my right thumb. Uh, her name was Morgan, she's still alive. But when she came down from the basket, it dislocated my thumb and cause scar tissue to effectively scar down so that now my left hand literally doesn't open as wide as my right hand. And it hasn't done that since I was in my early 20s. Um, and that's okay, but that happens. And so I'm sure some of you guys or some people that you know have got some scar tissue that limits the range of motion that someone's able to do at the joint. Now, Another major confounding variable is genetics. 
because some folks naturally have a greater amount of ligamentous laxity and mobility like my wife. Um, sorry, honey. But in reality, like it turns out she and her siblings have always been prone to more of uh, dislocations and then even some tears. Your sister, she tore ACL in high school. What did Brian do to his knees? Yeah, like she and her siblings, like literally her kneecap will just dislocate on occasion and then pop right back in because that's just the ligaments of laxity that they have. It's probably mostly caused by the fact that they genetically come from a line of soulless gingers. And so they're not held together with the same amount of morality as the rest of us. Well, I'm getting no response from the students, so I don't know what that means right now. But no, I just enjoy picking on them because it's fun, uh, even though I come from a line of gingers also. That's why anytime that shows up in my beard, I rip it out aggressively. Yeah, supposedly there actually is a genetic component for your average individual of red hair actually does have naturally a greater range of motion in their joints and a greater amount of ligamentous and tend tendinous flexibility. Um, but, you know, this is one of those things that I learned from a strength coach whenever I was working as a graduate assistant strength coach in my master's. So big grain of salt, but I enjoy giving your tr family trouble. But anybody here, uh, either you or know of someone that like their family members or their friends like are just, they've got all their double jointed everywhere. They've got just a really big uh, flexibility without really doing anything to really work on it. And that's going to be genetically related sometimes to things like the actual collagen production that you have, which arguably helps them for mobility based sports, but actually puts them at an increased risk for injury in combat contact sports because of that greater amount of flexibility. And then finally, there's age. And that is, is getting older, does that make you less flexible? And let's see here. Okay, so Sam's going to go for it. Sam, why would you say getting older is going to make you less mobile? And I unmuted you so you know. Um, well, I used to be really flexible, and then, like, I started lifting a lot of weights, mm -hmm. and I didn't really stretch as much, so now I'm not as flexible as I used to. Okay. Now, therein lies a big question, Sam, which is, are you less flexible because you got older, or are you less flexible because you haven't really worked on it? And, like you pointed out, you obviously focused on getting stronger, which depending on the amount of range of motion you're using, is going to possibly make you more or less flexible, and in your case, less flexible, because you had a greater range of motion beforehand. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it could be just because I didn't focus on it more. Because mm -hmm. Lord knows, I spend approximately about 20 seconds a week trying to work on my full splits, and turns out I do not have my full splits. But then I spend approximately 20 hours a week picking things up and putting them down. And it turns out I kind of look a little bit like I spend a lot of time picking things up and putting them down. So with the age thing, now Sam is a highly active, you know, physically capable young person. Now, if we were to look at somebody that's just been a couch potato, so effectively they just go from sitting in a chair, hunched over, to standing up kind of hunched over, to laying down. And if that's the only range of motions they're putting their body in, it turns out their tissues are tightening up so that all they have to do is go through those ranges of motion. So age can definitely decrease range of motion, but don't think of it as age. Think, it is, think of it as that chronic activity level or lack of chronic activity level and the mobility work that they're doing. So thank you, Sam. I'm going to unmute you so you can say that whatever you want about me and it won't be recorded. Now, we're going to learn more about these sensory units whenever you guys are in exercise physiology, but you have what's known as your Golgi tendon organ. Now, it's inside the tendon. When it detects a stretch upon the tendon, it's going to tell the muscle to quit contracting. 
because if the tendon keeps stretching, the tendon will literally rip off the bone. Now, you then have the same type of receptor, only it's in your muscle, and that's the muscle spindle. When it detects a stretch on the muscle, it tells the muscle to contract, because if you overstretch the muscle, the muscle will literally tear. Now, both of these are set as safeguards. If any of you guys, like right now, try to aggressively get into a, a full splits, you would feel your groins contracting. Because, like, oh no, oh no, I am not letting these things tear. And whenever you, if unfortunately we cannot watch this in the wild, but how many of you guys have ever gotten to see the amazing thing that is the, uh, the complete and total bro fail on the squat or the bench press, where the guy, you know, he takes the bar out of the rack, takes like one or two steps, starts to go down, and then boom, his legs just give up on him and he just collapses to the floor. Or, you know, they're on the bench, they bring the bar out, they got it, they got it, and then it just looks like God used a stapler and just stapled that thing to their chest. Any of you guys ever had the chance to watch that? Because it's awesome. As long as they live, which is most of the time. Good. And that's through training, Blaine. As we train, as we become more and more well-trained, our muscle spindles actually become more active through plyometric style training. So that's going to allow you to get a greater stretch reflex through your muscle to make you more powerful. So like whenever you are doing like a heavy front squat, when you're riding it fast out of the hole, where you get that bounce and that effect will drive, not just off of the elastic structures of your body, but also through putting that quick stretch on your quads uh, your, and your glutes to a lesser extent. Now, on the other side, your Golgi tendon organ is gonna become less and less sensitive to that stretch. In fact, I'm a good example of it, because I, you know, I tore my pec off the bone a little over two, two years ago. Actually, was it almost three years now, Lenny? Two and a half? Yeah, it was two years ago that I had the surgery to get it reattached. And yeah, I was doing weighted dips and it was just 115 pounds strapped to me. And I'll tell you what, rep seven. Rep seven is when that sucker just tore right off the freaking bone. I thought I had 10. Turns out I didn't. Um, and because what happened is when I got to the bottom, that's a stretch on the pec, it was more than what the tendon could bear. So when I contracted the pec to drive myself up, it literally tore it right off the bone, right off my armpit. And it feels like a, um, like a bungee cord snapping inside of your body. And then at the same time, like a thick magazine tearing um, inside of your body. And what the reason that happened is obviously the load was greater than my tendon could deal with. But typically the GTO would have just shut me down and I just would have slumped to the bottom and not been able to push against it. But because of all the years of my training and the fact that getting a little older now, whenever I pushed hard to push back, it turns out that muscle still contracted as hard as it could, which overrode the tendon's ability to deal with that force, which popped it right off the bone. So yes, you can change its function with time blame, but you have to be mindful of just because you are able to make that weaker, you're effectively removing the governor from your engine which means you can push your engine as far as you want. Okay, when I say governor for an engine, how many of you guys, have any of you guys heard of that before? What's a governor on an engine? Okay, so it looks like you guys are gonna get to hear another uh, story of young, really, really D-bag Mike Lane. So whenever I was um, doing my undergrad, I was driving back to, oh, Cameron, good. I'm not going to tell the story now. Cameron, you go ahead and tell us what a governor is on an engine. So the a governor on an engine that I know of, like when I was a little kid, I had a like mm -hmm. a little four-wheeler, and mm -hmm. all it did was it went on the engine and it just restricted how fast I could go on the four-wheeler. Bingo. It's something that's limiting how much force you can produce or how much power you can produce, or how high of RPMs you can go to when you're talking about your engine. Because exactly like Cameron said, guys, if there's no governor on your engine, you can just stomp on that gas pedal, the RPMs can go so high that it's beyond what the engine can tolerate, and then you throw a rod, you blow you know, something up in an uncontrolled fashion from that engine, and now, well, that engine's no longer useful. 
And it turns out when you blow the muscle in the human body, it's no longer attached and it no longer works. So you're screwed. Like after rehabbing for, it was six months uh, before I finally went in and decided to get the surgery done to get it reattached. I could take a 120 pound dumbbell with my left hand and press it for a set of 10. I could barely do an 80 pound dumbbell with my elbow up against my side, trying to use just my anterior delt and my uh, essentially my clavicular pec along with my tricep. I could barely press the 80s for a set of like nine. So it was, I'm still asymmetrical whenever I press things, like my right arm is definitely weaker than my left, but it was insanely weaker. So like literally only two thirds of strength. So at that point I was like, let's get this reattached. I'm young enough that we might as well get it done. Plus I tore my labrum uh, whenever I was in Kansas, thanks to a girl with the nickname of Basie. So I was more than happy to uh, get that replaced because that also was a thing that was pretty darn uncomfortable. Now, when we're referring to that stretch reflex, um, yeah, hundred percent. There is definitely a limit to what your physiology can do, but the reality is, is your tissues tend to adapt to the demands placed upon them. The key is your muscles remodel at about three times the speed of your tendons and your ligaments. So the issue with getting really strong really quickly is your skeletal structure can be lagging behind what your muscular structure, structure can do. So you can increase your risk of injury there. The other side of that is if individuals use drugs to cause their strength to rise way faster than they ever should have been able to, that's going to increase the risk of injury. Um, for me on the dips, um, for long story short, uh, suffered a severe concussion six months before that uh, pec tear. And I literally stopped doing bench press because anytime I bench press, I'd have a lot of symptoms. So I found anytime I lifted with an upright posture, it was fine. So hence I could do dips because I'd be upright. Well, it turns out my pecs weren't used to using that full range of motion. And since they were adaptively shortened, that put an adaptively greater amount of stress in the tendon which also is a confounding factor for why it tore. Um, but hindsight's 2020, and there's a couple other variables there, and I'd be more than happy to talk with you guys about training at any point. But getting back to Blaine's question, when it comes to the limit, most people are never going to work out hard enough for long enough with enough discipline with all the other realms of their life that they're really getting to the point where they're going to risk tearing things off the bone constantly. The people that this does happen to are usually folks that are taking super physiological amounts of anabolic steroids and competing on very high, like elite level strength sports, specifically things like powerlifting, strongman, Olympic lifting. I'm not worried about because I know Blaine likes to lift weights and likes to do a lot of, he's got a pretty, a pretty cool goal for what he wants to do with his front squat. I'm not worried with him hitting that goal and tearing a quad tendon. And, you know, same thing with any of you guys for the most part. Now, if, if Blaine took that same goal that he gave me and said he wanted to literally do twice as much of weight than what his current goal is, which is not a small one, I would get nervous that he's probably going to, he's going to get injured at least a couple times just in the pursuit of that. And in order to get to the lifting the weight that he wants to, he's definitely going to have to start using drugs that rhyme with testosterone. And that is also going to increase his risk for injury simply because the loads that he's dealing with are so much greater than his own body size that they literally have the capability to do irreparable damage. Like if you guys, want to look at um, uh, injury compilations on YouTube, I suggest never doing it, but you can see videos of a number of guys that like I know that I've met that I've competed against that have torn both quad tendons doing a squat, or they've torn a triceps on the bench, they've torn a pec doing bench press. Like when you push the human physiology beyond the brink, it's not so much you're gonna constantly tear them, but your risk is far, far higher than your average person. But then again, a number of people every single year tear their Achilles uh, tendon, the calcaneus tendon, 
and or tear their hamstrings from literally doing things like sprinting while playing a game of pickup basketball or beer league softball because their body is not adapted to those demands anymore. So they go out and try to go from zero to a hundred and then pop goes the music. So it's really important to keep in mind that chronic training volume. So what is your body used to? And if you're not used to doing this stuff and then you all of a sudden add a mass amount of volume, you've got a really, really increased risk of injury. So the myostatic reflex is the old school, the doc hits you with a mallet right on the quad tendon. From there, it's gonna go ahead and cause your muscle spindle to have a slight stretch, which notice guys, fires through your spinal column and then goes back out through the motor neuron and actually causes that twitch. And so when they're hitting you on the patellar tendon, they're literally, it's a test of not just your muscle spindle sensitivity, but then it's a test of your nervous system's ability to effectively take that information, reroute it, and cause a muscular contraction. Now, when it comes to how can we increase flexibility, well, it turns out we're going to do some form of stretching. Now, active is where we're going to be using literally tension in the antagonist muscle to help us contract it. So we're trying to contract our triceps while pulling back our arm to stretch into our biceps to allow us to go ahead and get that stretch in the muscle. Now, passive is going to be where we just have a relaxation and then we're just gonna go and sink into it and then allow for that stretch to occur in the muscle and in the muscle belly. We then have ballistic, which is not a good choice, and that's going to be that type of bouncing stretching. And um, yesterday, well, for the past two or three weeks, because I'm quite bored, um, on Mondays I've been lunging a quarter mile on the uh, football field, and my freaking legs are Tyrannosaurus wrecked. So I'm not going to be demonstrating squats or anything today because they are very upset with me. But then we've got static, which is where you're going to be holding that stretch for a long period of time. In all reality, if you're really trying to lengthen tissues, you've got to spend a quality amount of time in there. And that's a good thing to do at the end of a workout. Static stretching at the beginning of a workout can sometimes increase your risk of injury and or decrease your maximal force production, your power production. But do not be afraid of having an athlete stretch before a workout because the key is with stretching, are we stretching them out so they're going to have the range of motion they need so they're going to be able to do the movement safely or are we stretching them out so that they're going to be hypermobile and able to do more as far as range of motion than what they really need to be successful with their sport now the last one that we have is going to be what's known as pnf stretching and this is one of the most effective ways to be able to rapidly increase range of motion with an individual and what we're literally doing is we're using the stimulation on both the Golgi tendon organ and the muscle spindle to literally allow for a greater amount of relaxation by causing the Golgi tendon organ to be activated while we're getting a, effectively a grunted effect of the muscle spindle. And this is where if my wife was in the mood for me to have her do some stretching out, which I don't think she probably wants to do this morning. Hello. Yes, what's up, Jalen? Good, how are you? Good. So how can I help? Nice blur. I'm in class consistently until six. What's that? Sorry. That's okay. Thank you. All right, so for example, if we're gonna to try to do PNF stretching, um, if any of you guys are at home with a friend or family member, anyone that's awake and going to give you consent, what you can have them do is lay on their back and if you don't mind I'm giving a shot on me. Okay, this is, this is why it sucks to be married to me because I'm a horrible human. Okay, so Lauren is now laying on the ground. She's gonna lay on back and act like she's comfortable. I'm glad you weren't to this, so now they're gonna see my big 
facing them. <laughs> okay, so go ahead and flatten one leg, give me the other leg to the ceiling. So there you go. Nice. Okay. Tell me when you feel a good stretch. Yeah. Okay. Now I want you to go ahead and try to push your heel into the ground. Keep going, keep going. Five, keep pushing. Four, keep pushing. Three, keep pushing. Two, keep pushing. One, keep pushing. Now relax, relax, relax. So you get a little bit more range of motion there. Okay. So what that's doing is my wife was pushing into my shoulder while she was on the ground. And by pushing into me, what she's going to be doing is putting a, strike, a slight stretch on that tendon so that when she goes and then relaxes, the muscle spindle is going to then in turn allow the muscle to relax a bit further, which allows her to get just a couple more degrees. And this is a really, sorry, there's a bit of a hoedown throwdown for a second on the, on the chair over here. Bahamut decided that he really wanted to have the chair and Tinks learned very rapidly to let the Wookiee win. So, Okay, cool. It's definitely a little crazy in here this morning. Thank you guys for tolerating this. Now, we can have arthritis. This is going to be effectively the degeneration of that cartilage we have with the joints. Now this is gonna involve pain, swelling, changes in range of motion and stiffness. There's a lot of different causes for this. And this can be effectively, this can occur because of a lack of work in the joint, so the joint doesn't have to remodel, the tissues aren't getting a lot of blood flow, they're not going to be recovering, or too much, and that we're grinding it down faster than it can recover. Because if you think of your, effectively your cartilage, as almost kind of like the tires on your car, the tires in this example can actually regenerate. Now the problem is, if the tires just sit and the car never moves, then we're going to have that bowing and irregular force on that tire, and effectively when we do drive, it's going to be a little bumpy, probably not work as well as it should but then obviously if we're driving it too much and especially with bad alignment and maybe driving it like a bit of a jerk we're going to burn through those tires far more rapidly and it turns out you can replace tires and that's expensive but replacing joints is even more expensive so to keep in mind that we're trying to allow our joints to go through their full range of motion that we're applying enough stress so they're going to remodel and be able to deal with greater forces in the future but not so much force so quickly that we're not able to recover from it. And so you can have not just osteoarthritis, you can have uh, tendonitis and otherwise, that's gonna give you some indications that you're asking your joints to do more than what they prefer. And it's just important to allow for the body to recover and that requires not just rest, but active movement that's not going to cause a greater symptomology and not just with that active rest and avoiding the greater symptomology, but also keeping in mind that we're giving the body the nutrients it needs in order to recover. And that's where you see things like collagen supplementation as a means to help increase joint uh, health and effect or effectiveness. And sometimes people using things like glucosamine, uh, MSM, chondroitin, other different types of supplements to help improve joint health. And so, there's a number of common ways that we can injure our joints. It's just, like I said, important to make sure that we're applying the stress to the joints in a way that they can tolerate and never pushing the body beyond what it's meant to do. So any questions, comments, concerns? Because we definitely went through a solid amount of information today. And um, thank you, honey, for demonstrating a greater range of motion in the shoulder and then allowing us to show PNF stretching off for a second. Um, any questions, comments, concerns you guys want me to go and go through with you guys? All right. Madison and Jessica, you guys have been pretty quiet. Go ahead and give me a question that you have about what we've gone through today. Or I'm gonna ask you a question. Um, when we were talking about like stretching before mm -hmm. activity. Yeah. And how like, is that also kind of connected to why you're supposed to warm up before you do stuff so that you're like, is to reduce the risk of injury with your tendons? Is that kind of similar? Tendons and muscles. 
because your muscles, your tendons, and your joints all tend to work better at temperatures a little bit higher than that 98.6 that your body's typically at, hence why you literally warm up. And so stretching is at least a way to get some movement in those joints and then possibly increasing the temperature, but not as much as, you know, like a warm up that would involve doing like some low level jogging, a bunch of body weight calisthenics, anything to kind of get the heart rate up, but also get the muscles and joints moving that you're gonna be training in that workout. So, good question. Jessica, anything you wanna go and throw out there? Um, I'm pretty much good on everything for right now. I don't really have any questions at the moment. Okay, so then I want you to go ahead and give me the basics of what Wolf's Law is. Um, like with just like how it's like carried out or you can go how it's carried out or like kind of what's the basics of it. Like how the, um, like different parts of the bone are like, um, like rebuilding. Yes. And they're not just rebuilding, but what it also is occurring to our bones. Um, I guess like the, um, like activity of like the osteoblast and osteoclast, like, um, like that activity level, like depends on like the, um, like the stress is placed on the bones. Bingo. Bingo. So our bones are constantly both being built up and torn down. And the key is which side is becoming effectively more potent, the anabolism or the catabolism building up, breaking down is going to come down to exactly the signals that you're sending the bone. So are you doing enough resist, is there enough resistance impacts and otherwise being applied to those bones that they have to go and remodel in a way to build more bone mineral density? Or you have lower demands, so the body's just gonna free up that calcium and send it elsewhere because it's no longer as necessary or as useful because the bones aren't encountering that much force. Okay. Okay. So guys, uh, good stuff. Obviously we're gonna finish up a little bit early this morning. Stay safe out there. Uh, miss seeing you guys in person. Um, you know, when in doubt, don't ever hesitate to uh, send me a message or, you know, obviously to ask questions via the chat or via unmuting yourself whenever we're lecturing. Um, turns out, uh, yeah, I don't really like talking to myself. It just seems kind of weird. And yeah, otherwise be safe guys. Make sure you're staying on top of your group projects. So still be talking with your group, do your best with those videos. I understand there's a lot of limitations right now on how you're gonna be able to try to get that done. And um, yeah, guys, stay safe out there. And I'll have this up on the YouTubes sooner rather than later. So see you guys on Thursday morning. Be safe.